Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The troublesome turn-of-the-century German poet Stefan Georga, whose lyricism was extremely beautiful and whose politics were merely extreme, prided himself on being provocative. Once, for instance, he scolded his disciples for having attended universities. Such institutions, he said, were worthless. Such knowledge was useless. Fifty books are enough for any respectable human being, he declared. All the rest was merely education. Some days I fantasize about staying in bed for the rest of my life, sunk among pillows, promiscuously reading book after book the way one remembers having read as a teenager when there was all the time in the world. Other days, feeling more severe, I'm inclined to agree with Georga. How many books, after all, have left you utterly changed in their wake? How many have been truly extraordinary, the only sort of book that matters? And on still other days, today for instance, I would want to plump Georga's snide assessment from 50 books to 50 authors. Authors one devours whole. Authors who have defined for you the ambitions of the imagination, clarified for you the terms of human life. We love certain of them for their great souls, George Eliot, for instance, or even better, Tolstoy, because there is not a single human emotion that he did not know, understand, and sympathize with. And we love other writers because of the sublime narrowness of their perspectives. Take the vertiginous work of an Emily Dickinson or of Vladimir Nabokov. Anyone's pantheon will have 50 very different pedestaled busts, 50 authors who make you stop when a new book appears, stop everything to sit down and read. In my pantheon, amid the usual suspects, no less revered for being familiar, is one special shrine to Shirley Hazard. It has been 20 years since her last sublime novel, The Transit of Venus, appeared, an unusually long wait to mope by the side of a shrine. <laughs> to console myself, I kept thinking of something Flannery O'Connor once predicted. The great novels we get in the future, she wrote, are not going to be those that the public thinks it wants or those that the critics demand. They are going to be the kind of novels that interest the novelist. And the novels that interest the novelist are those that have not already been written. They are those that put the greatest demands on him that require him to operate at the maximum of his intelligence and his talents and to be true to the particularities of his own vocation. The direction of many of us will be towards concentration and the distortion that is necessary to get our vision across. It will be more toward poetry than toward the traditional novel. That almost precisely, indeed uncannily, describes Shirley Hazard's new novel, The Great Fire. So long in the making, so brilliant now, at last in our hands. Let me go back over some of O'Connor's stipulations. The novelist will be required to operate at the maximum of his intelligence and talent. It may be easier to write about the world at war than about the world just after a war, a time that calls for enormous subtlety. In the Great Fire, we are in the world directly after the Second World War and its atomic conclusion, with lives torn up and worn down by the displacements and deprivations of wartime rigors. It is a world of crumbling empires and emerging powers, a time when all sorts of new relationships are necessary between a veteran and his actions, between a nation and its past, between a child and her family, between a man and himself. If I speak of Shirley Hazard's intelligence, it is to remark on the precision of her descriptions of a world in transition. And if I speak of her talent, it is to remark on the profundity of her treatment of the human actors on this world stage, the tenderness of her portrayals of individuals caught in and struggling against the constraints of circumstance. The heroes of her new novel, the 17-year-old Helen Driscoll and the 32-year-old Major Aldred Leith, she impulsive, he reticent, she innocence, he experience, are characters of remarkable depth, and their story has an operatic sweep and tension, the high drama of two lives approaching a third existence out of space and time at once fraught and miraculous. O'Connor also speaks of concentration and necessary distortion, or a better term for both of these perhaps, of poetry. And here is Hazard's new novel to the life. I don't know of any recent book with the edge and shimmer of the great fire. 
Of course, this has been the hallmark of her work from the start, from, that is to say, the publication of her first book, Cliffs of Fall, in 1963, and in each of her subsequent books, The Evening of the Holiday in 1966, People in Glass Houses the next year, then The Luminous, The Bay at Noon in 1970, and The Transit of Venus in 1983, to say nothing of her two books about the United Nations and her memoir of Graham Greene on Capri. In all of these books, and now gloriously in her latest, is a stylistic control of real elegance. I thought of Shirley Hazard's mastery the other day while sitting in my car as it was being towed through a car wash. All around me, inches away and in plain sight, were shooting cascades of boiling water, giant crushing boulder brushes, medusa heads of spun strips. And there I was in the midst of it all, calmly sitting there, watching the fury come and go. So too, in all of her books, can our novelist reveal the heart's torments and hollows, its bitter longings and mean secrets in sentences as cool and steady as sculpted marble. She is, quite simply, a novelist's novelist's novelist, a perfectionist of the rarest order, a storyteller of mesmerizing powers, a conjurer of exotic places and home truths, a diagnostician of the heart. How lucky we are this evening to listen in as she reads from her masterpiece. Please join me now, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming the incomparable Shirley Hazard. Thank you all so much. Thank you for coming and coming to listen. And Sandy, how can I live up to words like that? I love generosity. It's the, it's the best thing in the world. And Sandy has that in, in abundance. And I will read uh, tonight from the beginning of my new novel, the opening, some opening passages, and then one little passage further on. I want to say that the, um, this question of what one draws from the past and of course some people do write much more autobiographically than others and some write autobiographically at one moment and then add their imagination at another but uh, it's uh, it's been because the setting of this book which has been very important to me to um, to remember and to keep alive in as far as, as I can do so a place and time which has completely vanished from the earth. A lot of the places are now disrupted by, by skyscrapers, look completely unrecognizable, and that's the world that we live in. And also the time, because history is how people felt, and those feelings are very hard to recapture. They can't be forced. And in a way, the, the places in what we, we then called the Far East that I lived in when I was very young, when I was adolescent and then a little later, they, uh, they, they are hard, very hard for uh, most people to remember. They've been so transformed by events and by uh, the physical disruptions also. But I have, never, I have never lost the feeling of them. I can say it's been in some, in some measure with me every day, that, that remembrance of that e extremely dramatic experience of my life there and in the drama of that world. And so I, I've never been back because I wouldn't, want to, um, I wouldn't want to destroy the memory of the place that I have kept alive. Someone came up to James Joyce one day and said, let me shake the hand that wrote Ulysses. And Joyce said, this hand has done other things and it's a certain difficulty of putting those things together. People, I think, uh, the world likes to trace the, uh, the author's life in the novel, but the obvious isn't always true. And something that was very close to you and resembles your experience isn't necessarily the, the deepest version of the story. And I also, I see that several, re various reviewers, also in favorable context, have said, however, the girl in the novel is too literary. She has read too much to be believable. 
And I think this is a reflection of our times um, <laughs> because when, when I was that age, I had read a great deal and uh, that I was surrounded by people who'd read a great deal and read it very young. And we were, in a way, one's uh, companions with, uh, in life with whom one found affinity. We were walking anthologies. We, we loved books, and we lived in them in perhaps a deeper way than in some large portions of our young lives. So I, I, don't, um, I, don't, I discount the fact that it wouldn't be believable. I think what's happened is uh, so many other forms of, you might say, entertainment passing the time have come in, and one has to remember that nobody in my book has ever seen television. This is 1947, and it, wasn't, it was only being developed at that time. So books were what we read. And my book begins, this novel begins with a man in a train holding a book in his hand. And when he gets off the train, which arrives very late at its destination... There's an army driver has been sent to meet him, and the officer says, I think you had a long wait. And the driver said, that's all right, I had a book. These are not... That was then a completely usual conversation. It wouldn't be the case, I think, now, only very rarely, because now the driver would have a walkman and a cell phone, and the man on the train would have had a cell phone, and God knows what else. But books are still around, and... You bear witness to that. So this is the beginning of my book. Now they were starting. Finality ran through the train, an exhalation. There were thuds, hoots, whistles, and the shrieks of late arrivals. From a megaphone, announcements were incomprehensible in American and Japanese. Before the train had moved at all, the platform faces receded into the expression of those who remain. Leith, that's the hero's name, Leith sat by a window, his body submissively chugging as they got underway. He would presently see that rain continued to fall on the charred suburbs of Tokyo, raising even within the train a spectral odor of cinders. Meanwhile, he was examining a photograph of his father. Aldred Leith was holding a book in his right hand, not reading, but looking at a likeness of his father on the back cover. It was one of those pictures, the author at his desk. In an enactment of momentary interruption, the man was half turned to the camera, left elbow on blotter, right hand splayed over knee. Features fine and lined, light eyes, one eyelid drooping, a taut mouth, forehead full, full crop of longish white hair, the torso broad but spare, the clothes unaffected, old and good. As a boy, Leith had wondered how his father could always have good clothes so seldom renewed, a seeming impossibility like having a perpetual two days growth of beard. The expression, not calm but contained, was unrevealing. Siding with the man, the furniture in the picture supplied few clues. A secretary of dark wood was fitted in its top section with pigeonholes and small closed drawers. This desk had been so much part of the climate of family life, indivisible from his father's moods and even appearing to the child to generate them, that the son had never until now inspected it with adult eyes. For that measure of detachment, a global conflict had been required, a wartime absence, a voyage across the world, a long walk through Asia, a wet morning and strange train. There was no telephone on the desk, no clock or calendar. A bowl of blown roses, implausibly prominent, had perhaps been borrowed by the photographer from another room. On the blotter, two handwritten pages were shielded by the tweedy sleeve. Pens and pencils fanned from a holder alongside new books whose titles, just legible, were those of Oliver Leith's novels in post-war translations. There were bills on a spike, a glass dish of clips, a paperweight in onyx. No imaginable colors other than those of the foisted flowers. 
No object that invited by its form or material the pressure of a hand. No photograph, nothing to suggest familiarity or attachment. The adult son thought the picture loveless. The father, who had famously written about love, love of self, of places, of women and men, was renowned for a private detachment. His life and that of his wife, his child, was a tale of dislocation. There were novels of love from Manchuria to Madagascar. The book Newly to Hand, outcome of a grim post-war winter in Greece, could be no exception and was called Parthenon Freeze, F-R-E-E-Z-E. If the man had stood up and walked from the picture, the strong torso would have been seen to dwindle into the stockiness of shortish legs. The son's greater height, not immoderate, came through his mother, his dark eyes also. All this time, Leith's body had been gathering speed. Putting the book aside, he interested himself in the world at the window, wet town giving way to fields, fields soggily surrendering to landscape, the whole truncated from time to time by an abrupt tunnel or the lash of an incoming train. Body went on ahead, thought hung back. The body could give a good account of itself, so many cities, villages, countries, so many encounters, such privation and exertion should, in anyone's eyes, constitute achievement. Lee's father had himself flourished that trick of mobility, fretting himself into receptivity and fresh impression. The son was inclined to recall the platform farewells. He had the shabby little compartment to himself. It was locked, and he had been given a key. It was clean, and the window had been washed. Other sections of the train were crammed with famished, threadbare Japanese but the victors travelled at their ease, inviolable in their alien uniforms. Ahead and behind, the vanquished overflowed hard benches and soiled corridors, men, women, infants, in the miasma of endurance, in the steam of humanity and the stench from an appalling latrine. Deploring, Aldred Leith was nevertheless grateful for solitude and spread his belongings on the opposite seat. Having looked a while at Asia from his window, he brought out a different, heavier book from his canvas bag. In that spring of 1947, Leith was 32 years old. He did not consider himself young. Like others of his generation, had perhaps never quite done so, being born into knowledge of the 1418 war. In the thoughtful child, as in the imaginative and traveled schoolboy, the desire had been for growth, to be up and away. From the university where he did well and made friends, he had strolled forth distinctive. Then came the forced march of resumed war. After that, there was no doubling back to recover one's youth or take up the slack. In the wake of so much death, the necessity to assemble life became both urgent and oppressive. Where traceable, his paternal ancestors had been, while solidly professional, enlivened by oddity. His grandfather, derided by relatives as an impecunious dilettante, had spiked all guns by inventing, at an advanced age, a simple mechanical process that made his fortune. Aldra's father, starting out as a geologist, whose youthful surveys in high places, Bhutan, the Caucasus, produced first lucid articles, had soon followed these with lucid, harsh, short stories. The subsequent novels, astringently romantic, brought him autonomy and fame. Renouncing geology, he had kept a finger, even so, on the pulse of that first profession, introducing it with authority here and there in his varied narratives, the Jurassic rocks of East Greenland, the Levatic strata of Far Fair Islands, these played their parts in the, in the plot. In Oliver Leith's house in Norfolk, there hung a painting of the youthful geologist prowling the moraines on his shortish legs, a picture consequential yet inept, like a portrait by Benjamin Robert Hayden. Leith's mother, by birth a Londoner, was of Scots descent. There were red-cheeked relatives well-connected, a fine tall stone house freezing away near Inverness, had been a place of cousinly convergence in summers before the Second World War. 
Leith had not been an only child. A younger sister had died in childhood from diphtheria. It was then that his mother had begun to accompany or follow her husband on his journeys, taking their son with her. And on the move ever since, the son thought, looking from his window at the stricken coasts of Japan. Two years ago, as war was ending, he had intended to create for himself a fixed point, some center from which departures might be made, the decision seeming at the time entirely his to make, instead at an immense distance from anything resembling home. He wondered with unconcern what circumstance would next transform the story. From a habit of self-reliance, he was used to his own moods and did not mind an occasional touch of fatalism. He had himself some fame, quite unlike his father's and quite unsought. It was near evening when he arrived. The train was very late, but an Australian soldier sent to meet him was waiting on the improvised platform, Major Leith. You had a long wait. That's all right. They went down ill-lit wooden stairs. A jeep was parked on gravel. I had a book. They swung the kit aboard and climbed in. On an unrepaired road where pedestrians wheeled bicycles in the dusk, they skirted large craters and dipped prudently into small ones. They were breathing dust and through it smells of the sea. Leith asked, what were you reading? The soldier groped with free hand to the floor. My girl sent it. The same photograph, Oliver Leith at his desk. On the front cover, the white title, Cobalt Sky and Snowbound Acropolis. Leith brought out his own copy from a trench coat pocket. I'll be damned. They laughed, coming alive out of khaki drab. The driver was possibly 20, staunch body, plain pleasant face, grey eyes, wide apart, wide awake. You related? My father, I'm damned. They were near the waterfront now, following the bed of some derelict subsidiary railway. The joltings might have smashed a rib cage. You could just see an arc of coastal shapes far out from ruined docks, hills with rare lights and a black calligraphy of trees fringing the silhouettes of steep islands. The foreground reality, a wartime shambles of a harbour with its capsized shipping, was visible enough and could in that year have been almost any port on earth. The driver was peering along the track. You write yourself, not in that way, never too late. The boy plainly considered his passenger past the stage of revelations. A dozen years apart in age, they were conclusively divided by war. The young soldier called to arms as guns fell silent, was at peace with his superior, civil and comradely, scarcely saluting or saying, Sir, formalities no longer justified. Intuitively, too, they shared the unease of conquerors, the unseemliness of finding themselves few miles from Hiroshima. How do you manage here? The man had a deep, low voice. If one had to put a color to it, it would have been dark blue or what people in costly shops call burgundy. Can't complain. Not much to do when you knock off except booze. No girls, not that you want. Too many people doing things for us, and then we're not let out that much. A lot of idleness in this occupation game. Night fell, crudely splashed along the piers with bright official lights. Reaching a sentry post, they were directed to a wooden jetty. When they got down from the jeep, a sharp wind billowed the officer's open coat. Now he heard and smelt the sea, glimpsing its black motion beneath splintered planks, saw through the doorway of a shed a metal table and field telephone and tea in a tin mug. The drear and dented interior that in military matters passed for home. Two sailors of the Australian Navy looked at his papers. There was the indifference and slight hostility of indolence disturbed. They glanced at color ribbon, colored ribbons on his uniform. A small electric generator gave off, in addition to din, a whiff of scorching. Someone said, mind the cord. At the end of the jetty, a launch tipped her riding lights in reflecting waves while these men took their time, and the water slid about below rough timbers, charged with the oils and tar and detritus of overturned ships, as well as with more recent victorious victorious trash. B-29 
Beyond this inland, though not long landlocked sea, there was the ocean. In China, throughout two years, Leith had been in boats, ferries, barges, and sampans on rivers, lakes, canals. The ocean had not much come his way. Yeah, well, I suppose you can go over. He's not there but the brigadier. Gone to Kobe. And when will he get back? Yeah, well, should be tonight. I reckon he'll go straight home. Up in the hills, that's where he lives, not on the island. On the island, can they put me up for the night? <laughs> All the room in the bloody world, Buckingham Palace on abdication day. Leith went out with the driver. I'll need you tomorrow. I don't know your name. Name's Talbot, first name Brian, sir. Together they lowered Leith's gear into the launch, where a sailor stood silent at the helm. Leith dropping down beside his kit called, Goodbye then, and Talbot raised his hand. They were cast off, rocking on a swift sea, breeze rising and salt spray, a night sky starry above marching columns of cloud. The harbour lights drew away and dim lights of the town. On hills and islands there was an ancient darkness whose few lamps of kerosene or tallow were single, tremulous, yellow, frugal and needful. No fishing lights, the helmsman said, mine sweeping. He added a comment that blew away so that the, the soldier heard only weeping. Behind them on the pier, Talbot would be showing the book, his father, with a slight sense of betrayal, but it matters to have something to tell. Remarks would be made about the row of ribbons, the medal. In the boat, Leith was silent as if alone. Solitude flowing cold from the sea fairly streamed also from his companion's back. Ahead, the island grew electrically present in a grid of lights. In the pattern of disruption that had been altered Leith's life for years, a rival had kept its interest. Excitement dwindling, curiosity had increased. Occasion revived an illusion of discovery, as if one woke in a strange room to wonder afresh not only where, but who one was, to shed assumptions, even certainties. On the sea that evening, such expectation was negligible. Earlier in the day, in the swaying train, Leith had written to a wartime comrade, peace forces us to invent our future selves. Fatuity, he thought now, and in his mind tore the letter up. There was enough introspection to go round, whole systems of inwardness. The deficiency didn't lie there. To deny the external and unpredictable made self-possession hardly worth the price, like settling for a future without coincidence or luck. He thought how mood changes all like an accident. Cascades of bitter drops came across the boat. Lee's coat unfurled like a jib. The little riding lights rocking emerald and ruby would have shown the man smiling, as a man may privately smile at almost anything, over the memory of a girl or the prospect of a good dinner, at the discomfiture of an enemy or a friend, as a woman smiles over a compliment or a new dress. With Leith at that moment, it was the shared incident of the book that pleased him, the young soldier turning up at Kure with the same book in hand, a long shot yet familiar. The engine subsided. They were settling into the lee of the island, which was coming to meet them on a branch of white lights. At the mole, a uniformed sailor waited with a boat hook. The launch paused, plunged, sidled, drawing raucous breath. There was a paved quay dashed by foam and stained by tides, a stage from which a grandiose stair mounted to a portico of angled columns, a travesty of Venice owing much to Mussolini. The Naval Academy of the Defeated had become a hospital for the victors. And when he wondered, saluting the Antipodian sailor, shall I mingle at large with the defeated themselves, what I've come for, for that and Hiroshima? He heaved his kit bag out on the flagstone, sprang to the wet ledge and waved off the boat, stood a moment on the paved brink, scarcely thinking, only breathing the night and its black lappings. Indoors, a foyer whose beams and architraves might bring down the house was floored with gritty terrazzo and seared with light. Another huger stair resounded with occidental boots and voices, and with the high speech, soft or yelping, of young western women, 
astonishing because unheard in many months. Men and women in uniform, all Westerners, were going up and down, active yet not quite purposeful, unprepared for peace. They glanced at the new arrival climbing among them, and women noted a durable man. When he had registered his arrival, he was shown to a high, narrow room with an army cot, a blanket, and one infirm chair. The little room had an unconvinced Westernism, dimensions, door, window, taken on faith by untraveled Japanese draftsmen. The high window looked on a shaft. One light bulb dangled. Least so familiar was the heavy canvas bag that, resting by his feet as he sat on the bed, took on with its worn worn and weighted fellowship, the speckled contour of an old dog, barrel-bodied, obedient. Having flung a few things on the chair and closed a louver on the cold shaft, Leith went out again. He found in an office an Australian woman in her shapeless forties, talkative, good-natured as her brown wool dress. He inquired for Professor Gardner. He's gone to rest as if Gardner were a roosting bird or had died. He's been with the doctors. He's gone to take a nap. He's not that young, you know, and then he's been through the fire. Can I leave a note? Leith took a slip, wrote and folded, asked fatally, are you with the army then? Oh, an army wife just helping out, becoming arch with this heroic male. Husbands with the signal corps. I only came here last week. We were a hundred wives in a little ship all the way from Sydney to Kure, five weeks without stopping. Well, we did put in at New Guinea, but just for water, not to go ashore. Oh, wonderful. My first holiday ever. Morning tea in our cabins, the Chinese stewards, the laundry done. Oh, the tiny islands, the ocean. No worries, just to stop the kiddies from falling overboard, she chatted on, five weeks without stopping. Some of the women hadn't seen their man in four years. Got married as hubby went to war. On the ship, the officers took to us. There was one lass. Leith handed over his note. Oh, so you're the major then, Major Leith. Been inspecting you a couple of days. He's been quite on edge. Her glance went to the red inch of braid. He'll be down to dinner. They want you to stop by the main office. She thought his eyes, well, beautiful. A handmade arrow directed him to administration. In poor light, a khaki soldier of his own age was tapping with index fingers on an antique typewriter and did not soon turn round. Staff Sergeant Wells from Ballarat said, you never took your key, handing this over on a string. We never saw your papers. Documents were examined. Yeah, they told us, look out for you. A room to yourself. The Antipodian note was peevishly struck. None of your palmares here. It doesn't matter, I'm only here overnight. Ah, the room's there, you're in it, aren't you? leafing through credentials, some of which were in Chinese characters. How are we supposed to make sense of this? The translation's attached. What is it, Japanese? No, I've been two years in China. Welcome back to civilization. Then, as this um, character of mine, Leaf, has been two years in China, I just will read a very short incident from his Chinese times, which were just before this this beginning of the book, when he arrives in Japan. He is telling, as he he settles in Japan, he gets to know two young people, a a sick boy about 20 years of age and the sister who is 16. And he finds a great affinity with these young people and they want to know, they've led a very enclosed life and they want to know about the world and they ask him a lot of questions about his past and his life and he recounts these stories and he's pleased to do it having been the rather reserved man he's, then he's pleased to talk about the things that have filled his, his life and his war and so this is an incident of this man Leif in during his walk through China They asked him, that's the young people, they asked him, had he crossed the lines of the Civil War? Since the Nationalists had removed the capital to Nanking, how had he entered Peiping, the city about which they were most curious? Leith explained that the road to Peiping was cut and the railway, this is 1947, the city was besieged by the communists, but one could fly in almost daily. 
Mao would move, but not quite yet. Mao need only wait. Leith had, had crossed the lines at times by accident, but also by finding someone to speak for him in advance. He had regularly deposited his possessions, his notes and books and letters of credit, with friends at a British or French enclave or consulate. Did you have books to read on the way? That was hard. Books are heavy, as is water. I carried one indispensable book and a couple of Chinese lexicons in tiny print. One becomes starved to see one's own language, even on a discarded label whirled by a dust storm or among the detritus of stolen UNRWA supplies. Did you talk to yourself out loud, like Bilio recited too when alone, and even sang arias? Did you ever get lost? Often. Of course, since I had no precise route, everything was grist, but sometimes I'd find that I'd gone in a circle. Did you ever think that you might... What? Stay forever in some place. Helen meant love someone and remain and make a Chinese family. She was glad that he had not. Yes, once in particular. He was in Yunnan on foot and leading a mule rented in a village near Chaotung. I was going from Kunming towards Chongqing, where I'd left my tackle with a friend. It was May. He had slept in the open. After sunrise, came through steep bushy hills into a valley floored with green cultivation, less alluvial than the land preceding it, for now he was moving away from the great river, the Yangtze. By a stream, there was a line of low, close houses, each bowed under its scalloped roof. The hill above the tiny town was gravid in the way of that landscape, his grassy garments stretched like soft cloth over an imagined anatomy of ancient, unremembered walls, graves, and ditches, a tumid rise over which you might mentally pass your hand. On a nearer slope, feebly scattered with ash and poplar, a pair of pale horned cattle were grazing. A wood pile was deftly stacked, a basket hung from a branch, and there was a small shrine, arched and tended. On a third sharp peak, the stripped remains of a Halifax bomber, like the Ark on Mount Ararat or the ribbed cradle of some stranded quadrireme. Leith tethered the mule under a tree. Two men, in, two men in the valley had already left their work and were climbing up to him as he came down. A third man followed slowly. A woman in black tunic and trousers came from a doorway and shouted, voice ringing harshly out in that still place which was differently aware with the murmurous season. He explained himself. The third man who came on slowly and was deferred to was the village elder and spoke some careful Chinese while the others used dialect. This older man, lightly built, had possibly been tall until reduced by toil and time. Good face, hairless, Slight smile, courteous and unsurprised. A blue cotton gown faded to a chalky mauve and draped from a latch at one shoulder, cleared his ankles. The high, soft, circular collar was unfastened. A darker cloth had been wound about his head in a flat turban. Wide sleeves almost covered the clasped fingers. A saffron face with the Tibetan look common in that region and the clear, light eyes... Summoning this figure one year later, Leith was aware of the convex brow with its traceries of experience that had infinitesimally evoked the veined hill above them and only now found its place in his mind. Helen asked, what was the one book? And Benedict, her brother, the book comes later. What next? The bomber had been there since 1942, off course in torrential rain. That is Yunnan. It is named for that, the low clouds and fog, the cloudy south. There was an explosion after the crash, then a great fire that, despite the rains, smoldered on overnight. The villagers struggled up in the wet, but explosions kept them off. He did not tell that they could hear cries throughout the night. Later, they had stripped the wreck of whatever had not burned. They took away some salvage and what they found in the cockpit, cockpit. There were 15 bodies, and they buried them farther down under a cairn of stones. 
These had to be disinterred. Dismantling the cairn was rough work in the sun, but that was not the trouble. The remains had to be extracted and handled. The men worked in the sun, nearly naked, with cloths over their mouths. All were sick. They urged Leith to leave them. We're more accustomed. He said, I may be more used to it than you. There were identity disks and scraps of writing like scorched papyrus. They sluiced water on their hands. Bundles of camphor leaves were brought. When the work was done, they reburied the bodies and closed the cairn. Leith went downstream to bathe and wash his clothes. The smell would be weeks in his nostrils. The men came up as he was climbing from the water. When they pointed to the purple scar down all his side, he said it was the war, the war among his own people that had waited here even on its perch. In one of the dark houses, the elder showed him a heap of scraps, part of the flight manual intact in an asbestos box, some instruments of mangled metal. Lee wrote out the names as far as he could decipher and directions for finding the valley. He added underneath, Halifax bomber with complement of 15 RAF crash landed in low cloud on flight from Calcutta to Kunming, June 1942. 13 RAF non-commissioned officers and two pilots, one of them acting navigator. Graves of all 15 at this spot, recovered by villagers from wreckage farther up the mountain. He told the elder, when I reach Chongqing, I can send a message. After a time, men may come, Englishmen. The bodies will be taken away. To their families, yes. To their tombs, yes. That's it. Thank you so much.